In this episode of Ask Paul Kirtley, we're going to talk about moving your bushcraft knowledge beyond core survival skills. We're going to talk about using sleeping bag liners without getting tangled up. And we're also going to talk about fishing kit. Welcome, welcome to episode 77 of Ask Paul Kirtley, where I answer your questions on wilderness bushcraft, survival skills, and outdoor life. And I'm presenting this show from one of our little bush camps, our light camps that I spend some of my summer teaching from down in the south of England. And it is hot today it is about 30 degrees already it's not even noon yet it is very hot it's a bit cooler here in the shade um, we do have the gatwick flight path today some planes going over um, but hopefully because i've got the lapel mic some of that won't come through like it does on the camera mic but apologies if there's planes in the background it's just the way the wind's blowing today we've got some air traffic coming over but it is still a glorious day to be out in the woods and um, I'm just in between courses. I finished teaching a course yesterday and um, I have a day in the woods and, it, and it's fantastic. So it's a good day to be doing some videos as well as just relaxing a bit and um, having some time on my own, um, which is always good and restorative, um, particularly in the middle of the summer like we have now looking forward to the intermediate courses which are the intermediate course rather that's coming up as well as other courses and we've got some wilderness trips coming up in september with clients so there's lots going on and um i'll keep trying to answer the ask paul kirtley questions when i can and here is the first one of today's question and this is via the speak pipe facility on my blog at paulkirtley.co.uk where you can leave a voicemail and then I can play it back and we can all hear the question. Hello Paul, my name is James from Cheshire and I have a question for the Paul Kirtley podcast. I've been in the military now for almost 19 years as military aircrew and in that time I've done a lot of series training. Therefore, I would like to think I have a grasp of the basic principles of survival, including fire lighting, knife skills and basic flora and fauna identification. Therefore, my question is this. I would now like to expand my knowledge into more of a bushcraft portfolio. So what is the best way to do this? Do I take a specific subject such as wild edibles and solely concentrate on that until I'm comfortable and then diverse into another subject? Or do I simply start picking up knowledge from each area of interest and build my skills that way? I don't want to be saturated and run the risk of not learning correctly. As always, thank you for everything you do for the bushcraft community and keep up the outstanding work. All right. Um, interesting question there, James. Uh, thanks for uh, explaining your background and um, where you're coming from with that. Um, that's useful background knowledge for me. Um, so, yeah, it, to a certain extent, the answer's a personal one. It, it depends on what you're interested in um, because I think sometimes it's easier to study things and get it get more into things in more depth in areas that you're already keen on and um, so if there are areas that you're particularly keen on you mentioned wild edibles I don't know if that was just a, a random example or whether it is something you're particularly interested in but we'll use that as an example you could go down that route if you're particularly interested in wild edibles from all the, the the training that you've done and the core knowledge and skills that you have um you've clearly been taught about edibles or some edibles in your uh, survival training maybe that's an area you want to expand on maybe that's an area you want to go into in a lot more depth you feel like that's where you're being called to look at in more detail then do that there's no harm in that um 
you know, you've got that core baseline of knowledge in terms of what you need professionally, and that will stand you in good stead in, in any outdoor uh, situation, clearly in terms of just the basic understanding of survival skills and what your priorities are in a survival situation or a difficult situation in the outdoors, you've got that in place. And so you can then look at areas that are of interest to you when you choose to go outside you've got that backstop set of skills already and if you're particularly interested in foraging and wild edibles then I would encourage you to go down that route as far as possible. At the core of that of course our um, knowledge is knowledge of uh, tree and plant identification clearly if you're interested in edible wild plants edible uh, trees and parts of trees also fungi um, allied to that then you're going to have to um, get into your tree and plant identification and your fungi identification that's just part and parcel of that um, and I would say that is useful generally in your wider bushcraft knowledge because once you get beyond this is a dry stick I can burn it I can whittle something I can make a feather stick there's a few you know basic things that are not super dependent upon species although even with feather sticks there are some woods that are much better and more suited than others once you get beyond the real basics you have to get into the more subtle aspects of what works best for certain styles of friction fire lighting what's best for cordage what's best for many of the different utility uses what's best for making pot hangers what's be best for making withies etc 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 all that basic campcraft knowledge once you get beyond the real 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 baseline stuff you're into choosing particular species or differentiating between different species um, and having a hierarchy of choice these are the ones that I will use if I can because these are the best but then I can also use these um, but they have these limitations etc etc that's all dependent upon you being able to identify the different species so even if you go down the rabbit hole of wild edibles and learn a lot about tree and plant ident identification to back that up that tree and plant identification will then be useful um, for other aspects of your bushcraft if you then circle back and, and fill in those areas at some point equally another option would be to look at um, say for example the syllabus of our elementary course and look at the different areas that we cover on our elementary wilderness bushcraft course and use that as a template as a model for building your own as you the word you use portfolio to build your own uh, set of skills around that syllabus and that's something you can do you can look at the frontier bushcraft website for example and look at what we teach on on, a, on an elementary course and you can self study that um, and there's nothing wrong with that either. Um, equally, if you want some guidance on that, there is an online version of the elementary course, um, which you can find if you go to um, onlinebushcraftcourses.com. I have a couple of online courses now that help people study where they are, because clearly not everyone can come and do a course with me in the woods. It's not practical in terms of time, in terms of timings of the year. Um, I have a lot of people um, in Europe and North America and Canada and the US and also further afield um, who are interested in what I do via my blog and what I do via Frontier Bushcraft and if they want to learn in a, in a more structured way that's what a course always brings it brings structure and it brings prioritization um, we've got the courses in the woods here of course here and around the UK as well as some of the trips we do overseas where people can learn on the move but if people want to self-study of course you can get books you can get identification guides you can get bushcraft books and survival books and you can uh, and foraging books and you can learn that way and you can go out and find what's in your locality but if you want a bit more structure around and guidance around your self-study then an online course is a really good way to do that um, i've got two available at the moment i have the uh, online elementary which covers all of those broad-based skills and it covers them in a way that um, we can't do in the woods actually like at the moment we, we had an elementary course a couple of weeks ago it's warm um, I can show you how to build certain uh, shelters and my colleagues can show you how to build certain shelters for this environment at this time of year and that will be quite widely applicable but there are limits to that I can't show you how to build snow shelters I can't build teach you how to build certain shelters that work really well in the winter um, because we're in the summer and we're in this environment if I want to show you how to build northern forest shelters with long log fires I can't do that here very very easily and I certainly can't build Quincy's or other shelters and show you the subtleties of those 
on a video course, I can do that. And then if you're in those conditions, you can try those things. And certainly I know people who um, have been studying the, the, those modules in those courses have gone out in the winter and even if it's in their back garden and built snow shelters and then they've gone out in the woods in the, in the summer and they've built shelters that work in the summer. And so it's a way of self-studying where you are in a way that we can't do even on a physical course because you've got that spread across the seasons. Um, also with the idea of spreading across the seasons, um, I've got my tree and plant identification masterclass, which is the first online course I delivered. I've been um, five years in the making that course really. I started it five years ago at the time of recording this and the first version of that went out and it's been uh, evolving since then to where it is now. Um, it is a, a year long program, but don't let that put you off. It's basically a module a month that gets drip fed out to you that is broadly in lines with the seasons in the northern hemisphere and covering the common widespread useful species that we need to know for bushcraft um, in these environments both in Eurasia as well as in North America and that's proven very popular each year. Now that only opens um, around the end of the year, around the turn of the year, so that everyone can be going through the course at the same time. And there are also webinars, so live sessions with me, um, spaced throughout the year, um, like tutorials as it were. Um, and it's not massively overwhelming. I used um, the word sort of, you know, the concept of overwhelm and not being sat too oversaturated. Clearly you've got other responsibilities. That's a course that you can dip into, well both courses are, you can dip into as and when you want, okay? So have a look at those. You'd have to jump on a waiting list for the tree and plant identification course because, as I say, um, early entry starts in December. Um, entry stays open until normally about the end of January and then we get rolling properly with the course. You know, people, people as soon as you jump in, you get access to the first modules and you can get on with it and then it, 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 it is delivered over the course of the year. And then you've got access to it ad infinitum. If you want to go back and refer to any module at any point going forwards, it's there in your library and you can just look at them and use it as a reference. So that's quite a nice way, somewhere between completely unstructured, unguided self-study and having to go and do particular programs at particular times a year with the expense of doing that, the expense of travel, etc, etc. So it's a very nice happy medium that a lot of people are finding useful. And then of course there's lots of free resources on my site uh, at paulkirtley.co.uk as, as you no doubt know, but also there's some other good resources around the net as well. Um, and you, you have to be a little bit picky and choosy like any subject, but um, there are some good sources out there. There's some good foraging uh, sites. If you look at the Association of Foragers website, um, I'm a member of the Association of Foragers. Um, you will find there are other foragers there and some of those people have blogs, some of them have websites, they're sharing materials um, for free online and so that's a very useful resource as well looking at some of those people's um, websites, people like Monica Wild for example or, or Mark at Galway Wild Foods, two of the, the key members of, that, uh, of, of setting that group up. They put quite a lot of material out and you know following them on Instagram as well, they're sharing things. Um, so there's, there's, there's a lot of resources out there if you, if you start d diving into different areas. I would say having a good broad base of campcraft skills if you want to go out and use your, you know, set up camp, use the natural materials around you, and then while you're out, you can start studying in more depth the wild edibles, etc. I think that's a nice way to go. Um, it's hard to self-study uh, some of the trapping elements and hunting, etc., etc., and fishing unless you've got certain permissions but if you get a good relationship with a landowner that's got the right resources then that's possible as well and um, you may even make good uh, good contact with a gamekeeper if you've got uh, an association with a landowner and then maybe you by maybe offering to help out the gamekeeper they might show you a few tips and tricks about how they uh, how they uh, trap things or how they hunt things or how they manage things and um, those contacts can be useful as well if you want to go down that route but that's depending upon building up a, a relationship over time and with some of those people trust isn't necessarily built up that quickly uh, they're, they're very busy typically um, particularly at this time of year I know the gamekeeper here on this estate where where we run these programs from um, he's getting about four or five hours sleep a night at the moment he's so busy so somebody coming knocking on his door asking for a bit of help at the moment wouldn't probably be uh, greeted uh, with a positive response um, simply because he doesn't have the time 
And so you need to build up relationships with these people over time and, and be timely. But all of these things are possible, but some things are a little bit more immediately accessible than others. But I would say, have a look at the syllabus of our elementary course, um, see what maybe you want to fill in. If that's all completely, um, oh, you know, if you're completely au fait with all of those things you think, um, have a look at the syllabus of our intermediate course. Are you au fait with all those things? I suspect you won't be. Um, there's some people who purport to teach some of the skills that we teach on our elementary course who've come and done our intermediate course and struggled with some aspects of it. Um, because it isn't just about ticking boxes. I've seen that, I've seen that, I've seen that, I've done that, move on. It's also about depth of knowledge in particular areas. How many, you know, if you can do friction fire lighting, you know, bow drill friction fire lighting, how many different species of wood have you done? How, have you done it with all the different native species in the UK that you can do it with? Have you done it with those different species at different times of year? Have you then practiced with non-native species that work? There's a ton of depth just in that one narrow, one narrow little fissure. And so you can go right deep into those areas and, um, and if you want to do that. So don't just flip past the basics thinking you can move on. I would say go deep in those core areas as well, um, particularly the fire lighting end because um, when you need a fire most, that's when it's hardest to light one, as I'm sure you know from some of your training. But the more tools you've got in your toolbox, how do I get an initial flame? How many different ways have I got to make a smouldering ember? How many different ways have I got to take a smouldering ember into a flame? How many different ways have I got taking, of taking a small flame to an established fire? Um, different environments, different times of year, different resources. Just maximise that skill set. That's a huge skill set and, and knowledge base in and of itself. Wild foods is another one we talked about. Fungi is, is you know, separate again really to the trees and the plants. Um, and you know, there's thousands of species of fungi. There are some key ones to know um, that are edible, that are easy to identify and not that um, hard to distinguish from uh, poisonous species, but then there's a whole depth of knowledge there. So you can kind of 80-20 principle it. You can dip into different areas and kind of get 80% of the benefit of those areas by you know, getting 10 to 20% of the knowledge and skill base in those areas. And that's quite a nice way of getting a broad brush initially, but then you can swing back and go deeper into those areas, the, um, particularly the ones that interest you. Because at the end of the day, you've got to feed your interest as well. Um, and I would encourage doing that because if you fight, you know, if you're really interested in this over here, but you're kind of going, oh, I feel like I should do that logically. Some, sometimes there's place for that, but equally, if it's a pastime and it's a passion and a hobby, do the things here that really interest you first because you'll lap it up. You'll be more of a sponge and you'll learn those things. Then once you're starting to become satisfied there, you go, okay, well, let's go here. Uh, let's apply the way that I learned this to this area. Right, okay, let's lap this up and let's work on this and let's get really into this. So that's another way of doing it. And I would say getting that broad brush first, a sort of 80-20 principle, using something like the elementary or the intermediate as a baseline uh, guidance for a syllabus and then going into different areas in more depth is quite a, a good way of doing it for self-study. And as I say, I've got resources there that can help you with a bit more structure around some areas of self-study as well. So hopefully that gives you some ideas, that gives you some um, food for thought. Um, and uh, if you've got a further follow-up question, please feel free to get in touch, James. Always happy to chat about those things. Another speak pipe from Dan. Hi, Paul. Thanks very much for your amazingly informative blog and videos. Very much appreciated. I have a question about using a liner in a sleeping bag. I've been thinking of getting one both to keep the bag a little cleaner and in some circumstances to maybe add a little warmth. But I can't imagine how I could actually use the liner without getting it all twisted up around my feet. Do you have any advice about this? Thank you. Uh, well, I, I would say there's, I don't know what type of liner you've been looking at, Dan. Um, in my experience, there are three broad types of sleeping bag liner. Uh, there's sort of cheap cotton liners, which are often designed for use when traveling, and you can also use them for sleeping on or in beds, in hostels, for example. It's often the requirement. And those are also used as sleeping bag liners. Um, 
There is the silk sleeping bag liner, which is designed to go into a lot of modern sort of mummy shaped sleeping bags that a lot of us use for backpacking and traveling. And then there's also uh, fleece liners that you can get. Um, although I've not seen those so much in recent years, I think sleeping bags have got better for at the particular price points and, and the need for say a fleece liner to go into a cheap bag is maybe a bit less than it was 20 or 30 years ago, but they are still around, I'm sure. Um, the one you're, I'm assuming you're talking about, the, the one I certainly use, the type I use, is a silk sleeping bag liner, which packs down to about a bit less than the size of my fist when it's in a little stuff sack, and it is big enough to, to, to fit me inside, so it's very thin. It's also shiny, and with modern uh, sleeping bag uh, materials, it slides around inside the sleeping bag very easily. So basically you get into the liner like a like you would in, into a sleeping bag or a bivy bag and then as you turn over and move over it just comes with you, it just turns over with you and slides versus the sleeping bag if you want it to. Um, I personally don't find I get my feet twisted up in it, I'd fi I don't find I get twisted up in it at all and actually at the moment in this weather um, I haven't been sleeping in my sleeping bag at all. I've maybe been using my um, sleeping bag liner just as a very, very, very thin sleeping bag and I've been sleeping on top of my sleeping bag because it's just so warm at the moment. Um, so it's useful for that as well and as, and as you say, on colder nights or cooler nights, you can use it inside your sleeping bag to to add a little bit of extra warmth, or you can carry a lighter weight sleeping bag and then you've got that flexibility of the two. But personally, I don't find that I get tangled up in it at all. I wonder, you use the word imagine in your uh, voicemail there. I wonder whether it is just your imagination uh, causing some doubts, thinking, oh, I might get tangled up in it. Um, I don't think you will. If you literally just open your sleeping bag up, put your feet into the, li into the liner, Pull the liner up as far as you want it um, and then fasten your sleeping bag up as much as you need it and you'll find that you should be able to move around and the sleeping bag, te the sleeping bag liner tends to move with you and not twist around you. So hopefully that helps. Try it. I mean, the worst, what's the worst that could happen? You're going to spend, I don't know, $40 on a sleeping bag liner and you hate it. Uh, launder it and gift it to somebody who would really benefit from it and might appreciate it. I mean, that, that's, that's the worst case scenario. Um, you're gonna lose out, but you know, I think you'll actually find it useful. Uh, most people do. And thank you for the kind words as well, Dan. I'm glad you find all my other materials useful. I appreciate you letting me know. All right, question by uh, Twitter. This is from Mark and he says, listened a lot to your Ask Paul Kirtley and you never mentioned fishing in your bushcraft repertoire. What gear do you use, if any? Um, well, Mark, remember Ask Paul Kirtley's are about me answering people's questions. And <laughs> if people ask me about fishing kit, um, I probably would mention fishing kit, but I guess a lot of the questions haven't been about fishing kit. Oh, dry mouth, it is warm today. Have a sip of water. Keep hearing something creeping around behind me. I looked over my shoulder a little while ago, maybe you saw that. I think there's either a tree creeper or a nut hatch on one of the trees behind me, but I haven't caught sight of it yet, but I keep hearing something scuttling around. I don't think it's down in the leaf litter. We do have mice here that come out at night, little wood mice, but you don't tend to see them so much during the day, certainly not out in the open. So I think what I can hear is, is, um, is a bird on one of the trees behind me on one, of the, on, on one of the trunks. You guys might be able to see better if you're watching the video because you can see what's going on behind me. I know some of you have seen rabbits and hares and deers and all sorts, of deer and all sorts behind me in the past when I've been doing these shows. Anyway, um, fishing kits. Um, yeah, I, I am not a dyed-in-the-wool angler, let's put it that way. Um, some friends of mine, you know, they grew up doing lots of fishing, sitting by rivers, sitting by canals, going to 
uh, you know, man-made fishing ponds filled in quarries, you know, that have been stocked and doing lots of, you know, lots of fishing, catch and release stuff. That, that isn't my background. I have done some fishing in, in, in my past in terms of, you know, just sort of separate to the bushcraft side of things. So, you know, I do have, I have a fly rod, I have a, a, a spinning rod, um, and I've never really done much sea fishing, but that's something that I'm gonna look to, to change going forward. So I have done some lake fishing, I've done some river fishing, and yeah, course fishing, game fishing, I do enjoy it. Um, I do enjoy it when I'm in a nice environment. Um, and I've done, you know, posh fishing on the River Test, for example, somebody took me to do that once during the, the, uh, the Mayfly season, that was, that was mad, but, uh, but quite spectacular as well. We caught some really nice trout on the Test. Um, still a memorable day that one, so yeah, I do enjoy a bit of fly fishing like, like that, um, but equally I like just taking a compact travel rod, spinning rod, doing a bit of course fishing with with that and i definitely take a fishing rod with me on canoe trips overseas so you know fishing on trips in canada um which the thing that surprises people a lot about that is that you still need to get a license in some of those places um the license you need to get depends on the type of fishing you're doing and how much you think you might be taking out but there's a great fishing culture uh, you know out in the wilds in canada and i i like taking part in that when i'm out there as well and no it's true i don't um I don't spend a lot of time talking about fishing, but um, it is something that I enjoy doing. But I'm, I, I'm not one of these British hardcore anglers who spend, you know, have a trolley full of gear, know all sorts of different subtleties about baiting things. I'm not a carp fisherman, for example. So, you know, all this, you know, uh, it's almost like witchcraft around, <laughs> around you know, these spe special techniques that people have. Um, of, of, of how to how to get them used to what you're feeding them and all those things that that's not the type of fishing I've done I'm more the sort of person I, I like fishing techniques and fishing kit that is, I like fishing kit that's portable so both of my main rods my fly rod is a breakdown portable fly rod that packs down to a case that's that long and my spinner is a telescopic uh, rod that packs down to, to a case and you can keep the uh, reel attached to it if you want to as well so I like kit that's portable that I can take on journeys because that fits with what I like doing. Um, and then um, in terms of the type of fishing I like doing, it's more a case of I'm in a camp overnight, maybe by canoe, I'm in camp overnight, I'm gonna fish near to where we're camped. Maybe we've just um, come down near some rapids, for example, we're, we're camped, that's always a great place to camp, clearly. Um, you've got a nice camp there and you've got this run out where you've got fish feeding you've got nice oxygenated water and we've had some good success on trips fishing in places like that so um yeah it is part of what i do but it isn't like i'm not one of these sort of people who are obsessed with it so maybe that's why i haven't talked about it so much but um yeah and you know use use all sorts of things from you know in terms of if you want to get specifics for the course fishing everything from worms to sweet corn to um, little rubber jellies uh, you know we're on a jig uh, through to um, MEPS lures particularly in Canada they love the MEPS lures out there um, and yeah you use what the locals say works on the fish there so yeah that that's kind of typically what I've got in a little box a selection of those sorts of things along with my spinning rod which is a which is a, a, a telescopic Shimano rod um, and a little Shimano reel I can't remember the numbers but good good little kit and then the the fishing rod uh, the the fly fishing rod uh, was a sort of custom one of the guides that I knew um, that used to guide a friend of mine with with in fly fishing he could get these breakdown rods made and then um, you just put whatever reel you want on there I've got two different reels with two different weight lines uh, the rod um, has a piece that you can put in to make it full length or you can leave that piece out and make it shorter so I've got a lighter weight line um, on the reel for the shorter length and then a heavier weight line um, on the on the reel for the longer length um, and that all fits into quite a compact kit. Um, what flies I've got in the, the fly box 
I couldn't tell you. I know I've got some Dunkeld. I know I've got some that I got down on the test. I know I've got a few others that people made for me or gave gave me or I bought here and there, but I can't remember what they are. I'm not that much of a of a nerd. I have another friend who um, has offered to take me out doing some fly fishing, and maybe I will go out with him soon because I know he's very into it and. Um, Maybe he can teach me a bit more about the flies. Um, that's, that's, that's the extent of my knowledge. I've got some that I use and that they, they work sometimes. <laughs> so I, I, the, fly, the fly fishing is, is more occasional as you can probably tell, but I do enjoy it. All right, so hopefully that answers your question. Um, and then of course, you know, there's all the, you know, the, the, you're asking about fishing kit, but then of course there's all, you know, there's all the other stuff that we teach in terms of making primitive fishing kit, just hobo fishing um, that we teach people to do on courses. We teach people how to um, make nets. Um, I've fished with nets in places where it's legal to do so, or I've fished with, uh, I've been out with people who are legally allowed to fish with nets, uh, and I've done that a fair amount as well. Um, and so I, I've got a good broad base of understanding of how to catch fish um, to feed myself. And I think that's an important distinction to make as well. Um, there is the sport end of fishing and there's also the feeding yourself end of fishing. And I guess, you know, I, I, I err on the side of kit that is portable that I can use on trips and expeditions and techniques that allow me to catch fish that I can eat. Um, because really that's that's where I'm coming from with this skill set. I've never really done any catch and release fishing um, and just in terms of doing it for sport. That's not something that particularly interests me in terms of me spending my time. I, and that's no criticism of people who do enjoy doing that. There's a real skill to it and there's a real art to it. And um, the people who uh, do it are very dedicated to what they do. It's just, it doesn't fit with the other things that I do in, in my outdoor life. And that brings us to the end of Ask Paul Kirtley 77. Hopefully that's been useful. Range of different questions there. Um, different things to think about. Do check out uh, onlinebushcraftcourses.com. Um, you can leave your email address there to be notified when the uh, tree and plant ID course is open again. And at the time of recording, the online elementary course is open for enrollment currently so you can get a couple of free samples there of videos from that course as well as um, a video presentation from me on developing your bushcraft skills further that's useful in and of itself also useful um, if you're going down that path of some guided self-study using an online course so do check those things out um, they've been a long time in the making and i think they're really good quality uh, drawing together a lot of uh, my experience from over the years into those programs and um, I very much enjoy delivering them and working with people um, who are working through them. It gives you some access to me in terms of asking questions etc that you don't get otherwise. Um, but of course you've always got Ask Paul Kirtley to ask your questions and I look forward to answering more of your questions going forwards. Enjoy this fine weather while it lasts if you're um, in an area where we've got this good weather. Hopefully lack of water is not uh, bothering you too much. I do uh, sympathize with some of the farmers out there. Um, I have some friends who are farmers and particularly the dairy farmers are struggling at the moment. And um, hopefully you guys get some rain before too long. Uh, but maybe for the rest of us, if that rain comes overnight, then we'll all be happy. All right. Well, take care and enjoy the outdoors. And I look forward to speaking to you on episode 78 of Ask Paul Kirtley. Take care. Cheers. <laughs>